OK, welcome everyone to um, our December Parks Forum session. Um, today we've got presentations from Dudley, Dudley Council, and um, looking at um, the new National Nature Reserve at, at Saltwells, which is absolutely fantastic, and learning from them about um, how they've managed over the last two or three years with um, some pressure from development as well. So um, that's the first half of the uh, session. Then we'll have a, a bit of a break for about 10 minutes. And then the um, second part of the session will be um, from Rodri Edwards from the Fields in Trust. And um, he'll be talking a little bit about um, something that they've got on the anvil at the moment, um, how they protect sites and the new toolkit that, that they're developing at the moment. And then Chris, Chris Warman is going to um, give us a bit of an update on um, where we're at in terms of uh, COVID-19 and the various tiers that we're all in. So um, that'll be really handy. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Alan, who is going to try and share his presentation from Dudley. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. And it's uh, it's brilliant seeing so many um, faces that I that I know and that have um, been supportive through the years. Uh, I'm just going to try and share this slide. Come on, come on, come on. There we go. Hopefully, can you all see that now? Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Okay, so. Um, this presentation is going to be broken down into a number of different sections, as we've already heard. Um, roughly going along these lines, as we've just heard again. Um, so I'm going to start off and talk a little bit about Salt Wells itself to give you a bit of a background. And then John, who is the chair of the Friends of Salt Wells, can give you a little bit more information about um, some of our recent tumultuous times. Um, and then I can do a little bit of a wrap up after that. And then um, Dr. Jonathan Lywood is joining us from Natural England and can give us a lot more information on National Nature Reserve status. And then Graham Wharton, who's the Keeper of Geology at Dudley, um, has been absolutely instrumental in making uh, the Black Country a global geopark. He's going to give us a presentation as well. And then over to the Fields of Trust. So. We entitled this How a Threat Became Our Greatest Opportunity. Um, it was a couple of years ago, rather bleak, it has to be said. Um, but for those few of you who I don't recognise, this is where the Dudley Borough is, um, right in the heart of the Black Country. And quick introduction to Borough it's got just over 300,000 people. However, there's three million people right across Birmingham in the black country. So in our backyard, there's three million people, three million votes and three million people who want to get out and about and enjoy their open spaces. It's got lots of historical importance um, from a castle, uh, one of the, the cradles of the Industrial Revolution. And the borough is very much seeing that tourism is going to be one of its um, future key uh, economic drivers. So we're very much seeing the borough as needing to um, to maximise its, its assets for the visitor economy. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> However, these are the indices of multiple deprivation which cover the, the Salt Wells Nature Reserve. As you can see, the red is, is not an area that most people aspire to. Um, with the green being the areas where, you know, you think um, you're doing rather nicely. Um, so it's not in the most affluent of areas um, with particular issues around income, employment, skills uh, and health, especially affecting children. 
So it's very much a key asset for people on its doorstep and not just bringing people in from across the, the world as part of the geopark, as we'll hear later. So Salt Wells itself, is, um, I'm going to keep saying National Nature Reserve because it's a wonderful thing and uh, I'm not quite used to it yet, which is, a wonder, which is excellent for me. Um, it's in the heart of the Black Country. It's one of the biggest um, urban nature reserves in Britain, two and a half miles long and 100 hectares. Uh, we won the first UNESCO Man in the Biosphere Award um, for excellence and remains one of only, I think, 15. It, um, that number's a little bit, a little bit vague at the moment. I've got two geological sites of special scientific interest, um, one of which is managed in partnership with the Canals and Rivers Trust. We've also got a scheduled ancient monument relating to mineral extraction um, from possibly Roman, but certainly medieval bell pits for coal extraction. And back in 2017, we were proud recipients of the Countryside Management Association's Gordon Miller Award, which is um, the award given for best practice across the countryside management sector. So on the on the left of that screen is a phase one <coughs> habitat map. So you can see we've got a lot of woodland, which is in the green. And if you look in the middle of that woodland area to the west central west area, there's a small little blob of orange next to a grey area. That grey area is going to be quite interesting in a minute for what John is going to be discussing. Um, we're very famous for our bluebells, massive carpets of bluebells across the ancient woodland. Um, we've got large areas of grassland, which are shown in sort of the, the orange terracotta colour, and a lot of those are managed by meadow management and also by Exmoor pony grazing. Um, but a lot of our effort to keep us as good as we want to be comes from volunteers from right across the community, which are absolutely essential for the running of Salt Wells and also for its vibrancy. And in the bottom right, um, that comes from a wonderful programme which we were carried out, funded through Tesco's, where we were carrying out uh, activities for mindfulness activities for people with dementia. So we do very much look at the, the needs of the people around us and see how we can encourage them to come into the nature reserve and so it can help them but also help us so that's salt wells that's what a lot of people come from um just come and see and the tale we're going to hear next um comes mainly i think and john will correct me but for a lot of people from the love of this one particular tree which is a western red cedar in the heart of a uh, ancient woodland and it's half dead um, and it's not the prettiest of trees, but it's incredibly special. And the memories that are attached to this tree are what's um, kick-started a lot that's to come. A bit of a quick timeline. In the mid-1800s, Saltwell's house was built by the Earl of Dudley uh, for his mother or for his mistress, depending which book you read. Um, it then became um, used as a children's home. In 2001, that home closed. And this is on that grey area I was showing you on the map earlier. And 2010, the building started to receive significant amounts of um, abuse. It eventually had to be demolished due to arson. And the warden's base, which had our classroom and our, our garage and facilities, was also had to be cleared away at the same time. And the council needed a receipt from that piece of land. Um, obviously, it was a children's home. So the money um, was going to go back into our children's services, which um, obviously needed investment during this time of austerity. And in 2018, oh, sorry, the piece of land was then transferred to an arm's length company, which was half owned by Dudley Council and half owned by a private company, a limited liability partnership. And in 2018, a company called KB Extruders Pension Scheme um, put forward an outline planning permission for 19 dwellings on this part within within the ancient woodland. So although it was knocked down and fairly rubble covered at the time, it was naturally regenerating very fast and had everything from common spotted orchids to five meter high um, willow and alder. Uh, so there's some, uh, a map 
of where it is. The Merry Hill Centre, for those of you who have uh, visited, spent or suffered over there, is, uh, is shown in that aerial photograph. The red track leads off the Pedmore Road and into this area where Saltwell's house once was, where they wanted to put in these, um, these dwellings, which looked rather nice um, and lovely, surrounded by ancient woodland. However, over to John. Hi guys, um, real privilege to come and speak to you. As Alan said, my name is John. Uh, I chair the uh, Friends of Saltwell's National Nature Reserve, as I'm having to get used to saying, which is great. Um, I, I kind of, I don't know if ever you guys have uh, seen the painter Bob Ross, the guy, the American guy, and he talks in his beautiful voice, which used to put my daughter to sleep. And she, she has a Bob Ross t-shirt now, age 16. But, um, in Bob Ross's words, my involvement in the campaign and, and subsequently with the Friends group uh, was a was a happy little accident. Um, it was uh, I was on Facebook one day, um, saw uh, that there was a campaign happening and a lady called uh, Leslie Dunn, who was one of the real architects of the campaign uh, in its early stages, um, was telling people that the local newspaper was coming down to take a photo uh, about people that were objecting to the, the building of this development um, within the woodland. Um, if you uh, look at that picture, quite a few people turned out. Um, I, I was of the opinion that with these things, normally it's like three people and a dog. So I thought I've got a day off. It was a Tuesday. Uh, I'll head down. Um, I was greatly needed in this photo. You can just about see uh, my left shoulder in the bottom left corner and uh, a little bit of my beard, which formerly used to grace my face and uh, put me uh, twinned with Alan in that respect. But yeah, so um, the community got involved, got incredibly passionate very quickly uh, about this project. I think it surpri surprised some of us uh, and there was a huge range of people involved. As I say, I just turned up to help out with this photo to, to be another face in a picture and thought that might be the the sum total of my involvement and um, happened to uh, somebody came up to me and said, are you in charge? I don't know whether the beard gave me a sense of authority. Uh, I said I wasn't. And I said, I think it's this lady over here. I uh, took them over to meet Leslie, who I introduced myself to as well. At that point, the newspaper came to interview Leslie and ended up interviewing me as well. Now, I didn't really know what was going on, but um, as Alan will tell you, probably my main skill is the gift of the gab. So I, I put some little kind of points together and um, ended up being interviewed uh, for the newspaper. At that point, I think I'd kind of like I would put my boots too far in the project to uh, to walk away. So then uh, I don't know if you want to click on to the next slide, Alan. Um, kind of my my role and something that I took up quite quickly in that um, was this kind of media spokesperson role. Um, we ended up contacting um, local radio, uh, the TV, so with BBC and ITV, um, and they they were quick to pick up the story. Um, alongside this, there was a huge kind of gathering of pace on Facebook. Um, uh, a Save Saltwell's Facebook group was put together. There were petitions going out, posters uh, being put up all over the place. And unusually, there was a huge, huge growth uh, in the social media aspect. So when that, our traditional media and the TV guys um, saw that, they were very keen to to jump in with the story. Um, I've titled this slide, The Perfect Storm of People, Passion, Pictures, and a Pantomime Villain. Um, we'll play the video in a moment, but one thing that I did was um, we got a tiny little drone at the church where I'm the pastor, and I, I went into the, the woods and decided I'd take some aerial pictures of the area itself uh, and put together a little video with, with a bit of music put it on the site and see if that helped people to kind of get behind the, the project. Very quickly, it had about 6,000 views uh, and I realized that I needed to kind of keep this up. So I persuaded my wife to buy me uh, an early Christmas present, got a better drone 
uh, and you'll see some of the pictures that were taken on them by the BBC. But when we play this video, you'll understand where the pantomime villain comes into the piece, where actually I, th I think the very guy who was trying to get the project done was a huge boost for the project uh, that we were trying to put together to, to get the planning permission turned down. So if that video will work, Alan, let's watch that. Have we got any sound, Alan? Can't you hear that? Uh, no, I can't, no. <laughs> Can anybody else hear that? No, no sound no, from us. No, sorry. Oh, okay, no. Let me see if I've taken my that. earphones out, if that makes any difference. I do apologise for this. It's playing very loudly and nicely at my end. Is that any better? I think it's just coming through yeah. your your speakers, Alan. Right. In that case, if that's the case, I'm going to turn my speaker up as loud as can be so you can hear it. One second, I'll just have to exit the slideshow. Do apologise for this. I think I it might be a setting somewhere in sharing, but I, I don't know where. So try this approach first. I apologise if there's a load of feedback on this. <laughs> Can you hear that? No, it's still not coming through, Al. Um, okay. Bear with me. Keep talking, John. I'll see that's what all right. Back well, you know, as we said, we, we kind of ended up on the media. I ended up on uh, local radio twice um, and on TV. Uh, we ended up a little feature, I think, nationally on BBC Breakfast at one point. I had a, a call from... Um, some of my family down south and said, did you realise you were on BBC this morning? Uh, to which I was quite surprised. Uh, and then I think from that point, as the as the campaign started to gain momentum, we ended up with involvement from all around the country. We started to, first of all, engage with people who'd been local to the area, who'd maybe spent time uh, at the reserve as they were kids. Uh, then we started to get people from all over the world um, step in. Um, and what we realised was that we needed to harness the numbers that we were gaining on social media, not just to be numbers on a Facebook page, but to be actual voices in the campaign. So we, um, we, we went through this process. We tried to make it very easy for people to engage. So uh, I was fortunate enough, as I said, being a church pastor, we got a building which was pretty close to, to the reserve. Uh, we were able to hold a public meeting there, which we live streamed. And I think we had something like 7,000 people watch the live stream. And um, we were able to interview um, some people uh, that were already volunteering as part of the, uh, the, the group that helps Alan and the, the other wardens. Um, and then we we made a place for people to be able to come and get involved in formal planning objections. Um, now, as that went on, Alan, I don't know, can you remember the exact number or the roundabout number of objections that were placed in the end to the uh, the project? I can't. It was in the hundreds. Yeah, it, I th and I think I think we went up into the thousands. Overwhelmed by them. Yeah. So. So I was told by the, the, the guys at the council in the planning department that normally if there's a, a particularly strong objection, um, they'll get kind of somewhere between three and ten um, submissions. Uh, and we were well into the hundreds, even I think it may have gone into the thousands uh, uh, at the end. Um, incredibly strong feeling, but it was made possible really by um, a group of volunteers that came and sat for drop-in sessions, uh, both at the, the church where I'm the pastor and also at the pub that's local to the, uh, the nature reserve. People were able to come in, fill in these, uh, these objections. We were able to help them get online uh, and do that digitally. Um, and that the snowball just kept rolling. 
Um, I know um, my part was quite visible in it, but my part was being able to be a voice for some of the people who couldn't say what they were really feeling or thinking at the time. Uh, and also just being able to collate some of that information. There was a, a vast kind of amount of uh, knowledge about the reserve, about its heritage, about its ecology, about its geology. Uh, and I was just in a position at the time to be able to kind of take that that perfect setup uh, and get it out to the people who needed to hear it. Um, it looks like we won't get the video, but we'll, we'll send you a we'll link to that. Now, John. Oh, let's have a go. Give it a go. Is that working? Just about. Beauty spot. An online petition opposing plans for a housing development for the Black Country Beauty Spot. Campaigners say the luxury home could state the Saltwells Nature Reserve in Dudley by killing off woodland. The developer says there's a demand for eco friendly property. Here's our Black Country reporter, Tim Bodkin. Saltwells was one of the first nature reserves in the West Midlands. Amid the lush woodland, a reminder of its industrial past. Coal was quarried here and transported to steelworks nearby. In a secluded area where a manor house once stood, there are plans for nine, four and five bedroom luxury homes, each with double garages. An online petition opposing the application has drawn 7,000 signatures and campers, young and old among them, fear this green space will be lost forever. If anybody builds here, it's going to massively impact uh, on the environment, on the animals that, that call this wood home. Uh, we've got bats, badgers, uh, newts, the track that actually comes in here from the dual carriageway, um, scheduled ancient monument of historic uh, mining remains. It's special for so many families in this area. We are not an affluent area, and this is our countryside. This is where our children play where people cycle, where people walk their dogs. Um, the destruction to the parcel of land would be irretrievable. The developer is the Birmingham-based KB Extruders. It's a company that makes black bin bags. They told the BBC their proposal is entirely in keeping with the surrounding woodland. It's very disproportionate to have a small culture in comparison to what the wider community wants. For some reason, it's being seen uh, as, you know, we're trying to eviscerate the forest or it's a deforestation operation. It's a regeneration scheme. Uh, the land in which we are hoping to develop is that part of the existing nature reserve. The competition to build in this area is fierce. To see this new estate being built by Persimmon Homes on the fringes of the nature reserve. The faces among those objecting to these plans on the basis that it could lead to increased antisocial behaviour. So the council told the BBC it will consider the application in line with its normal planning procedures. I'll happily succumb to the passion of the people if that's what they want. But if you've got 7,000 petitions, if they were just passed off their funding, um, I will happily sell the site to them. I believe that will come to about 40 to 50 pounds a person, uh, and I'll sell it for the open market by legal trade by local agents. Small price to pay for some Indian believers. A passion for property versus a passion for preservation. A decision taken here could set the precedent the rest of the region. Ben Godfrey, BBC Midlands Today, Dudley. So uh, if you were able to hear some of that, um, basically the guy who, who was talking at the end, uh, if you didn't catch it, he offered to let us crowdsource the funding to buy the land off him. Now, there were a couple of problems with that. The first one, he didn't actually own it. Um, so so we, we kind of thought, well, that's not going to work. But the response actually from the community was incredible. Within um, 10 minutes of that going out on TV, I had someone knock on my door um, with an envelope full of cash um, trying to pass it to me uh, in the in the bid to buy this piece of land. I had so many offers on social media. We had to kind of put them right, tell them this guy kind of was, you know, getting a bit ahead of himself. But there was a passion and there was actually a willingness within the community to invest uh, as Alan said, we're not a, a prosperous uh, community. People were willing to put their hands in their pockets. Um, they stepped out uh, and they really kind of went beyond, above and beyond, uh, to make sure that this part of the, the woodland uh, was, first of all, protected from being built on and also then 
uh, to make sure that it was um, given back and designated back to be part of the nature reserve to make sure that this couldn't happen again. Um, the second bit, if you want to move the slide on, uh, Alan, and I'll, I'll whiz through, was um, we got involved in a political way uh, in this. There were a lot of a um, lot of people with very strong political allegiances, part of the campaign group. Uh, but as we met together, I felt it was really important that um, we didn't get kind of bipartisan on this project. Um, I've, the picture there is a hot potato. And that was the phrase I used. I wanted to make this a political hot potato that anybody in local politics um, that got involved with it had no option but to get behind the project. It was a it was a ticking time bomb if anybody was going to support against the great wave of public opinion at the, the building of the houses in the wood. We also weren't particularly bothered about who got some credit for it. There was a bit of initial kind of um, unwillingness to let certain uh, politicians um, kind of put their name to the project. But in the end, we decided that the best thing to do was to, to set them up and give them all the ammunition they wanted for a home run. It did, I didn't mind who looked good at the end of it, just as long as um, the outcome was that, um, that, that those houses didn't go up, that they didn't have the, the, the devastating effect that they really would have done um, if, we'd, if we'd have allowed this project to go through. So, Alan, do you want to chip in then on that, just that summing up bit? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, John. So, oh, where's the site at now? Um, I should say National Nature Reserve. The photo on the right, Liz, as you mentioned, that's our new Wardens and Education Centre, which um, arrived uh, last week. Uh, and the land which was going to be put into housing by the bin bag firm is currently um, being bought back by the council to make it part of the nature reserve again. And also, thanks to Lawrence, our uh, very helpful judge, uh, we were assessed for green flag this year uh, and won that award. So these are all things which two years ago we would have never have guessed would have happened. Um, thanks a lot to Jonathan, as we'll hear in a minute, for the National Nature Reserve. But the other three things were quite far out of our gift. Um, and it is because of the community of where it's pushed that we've got the backing of very much of the politicians of both main parties and also the local community. So now we've got the Friends of Saltwells, which John is the chair of, with a wonderful website. Uh, we've got increased volunteering, except during these COVID times. Our visitor numbers are absolutely through the roof, as I bet uh, most of your sites are as well. And our online ratings on um, Google and TripAdvisor are, are very, very, very impressive. There's some lovely comments coming through there. Um, and the Facebook group, which John mentioned, which was there um, to, as it says, save Saltwell's Nature Reserve, is still well above 8,000 members. So it's still a very, very active community forum um, for all things salt wells. So that's where the community is at now. Um, so, John, was there anything else you wanted to say? Nothing? No, just, uh, just saying, you know, our real key was just getting people's involvement and identifying people's skill sets. Um, we looked within the community, as I say, Mine was talking, always has been. Um, we found some great geologists, some people who were getting really involved uh, in the the ecology of the area, but also just people who were who were administrators. That was their gift. They were um, getting on Facebook, inviting people, getting messages out, um, you know, organising uh, all the petitions uh, and that kind of thing. I, the biggest lesson we learned was identify people's strengths and deploy them in the right areas. So, yeah. Thank you very much. I must say, as, as an officer at the time, they were a very formidable but engaging force. They always came with um, the hand of friendship and always wanted to get people in the tent rather than to divide people. And I think that spoke volumes across all political sections and within offices of the council as well 
Uh, we didn't get divisions, we didn't get fractures or anything like that. And it was just a very unified, friendly and positive group. So thank you very much, John. And over to Jonathan. Yeah, <clears throat> Thank, thanks, Alan. Um, I just mentioned to John, if you want that quiet evening in, I've noticed that Bob Ross is re-showing on BBC4 at the moment. Something to something to look forward to, I think. My, my daughter's very pleased about it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about National Nature Reserves. Um, we've got a new National Nature Reserves strategy as well. And I'll, uh, I'll also cover how um, salt wells fits into all of that. So next slide, please, Alan. Um, so National Nature Reserves, um, they were established uh, back in 1949 as part of the National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act. Um, and their purpose when they were established was to protect um, the best and most important wildlife and geology. Um, but they were also seen as um, laboratories for outdoor research into the natural environment. Um, we've kind of moved on a bit. To they still fulfill those um, uh, those purposes, but they're also very much places where we want to deliver and develop um, good conservation practice and particularly places uh, to experience and be inspired by um, the natural world. There's quite a range of national nature reserves from coast to upland. So that's the Lizard National Nature Reserve down on the southwest peninsula in Cornwall pictured there. Um, they're urban like what we're talking about, salt wells, uh, through to the most remote of places. They're large and they're small. Um, down at the bottom right there is a small limestone grassland, Barnock Hills and Holes, which is just outside Peterborough, where I'm, I'm talking from. So there are 224 NNRs at the moment in England, and about two thirds of those are managed by Natural England. And the remaining third are managed by what we call approved bodies and their organisations like the National Trust, uh, the Wildlife Trusts, uh, RSPB and local authorities like, like um, Dudley Borough Council. Um, so next slide, please. Um, we have this new uh, National Nature Reserve strategy and uh, we keep that standard, the best of geology and wildlife biodiversity and geodiversity. Uh, but within that strategy, um, there's a new um, there's a new goal, which is to develop a network uh, within the NNR series to tell the story of England's geological history. And to do that, we're going to use what we have. But when we start to find gaps in that, we seek to fill those gaps uh, with new national nature reserves. And that strategy, um, it's across all the NNRs and it's a partnership strategy involving all those involved in and responsibility for managing and looking after NNRs. So next slide, please, Alan. Briefly, let's just think about geology and national nature reserves and why we need that ambition. Well, if we look at the 224 NNRs, only five have been declared specifically for their geological interests and they're pictured down below there. Uh, Charnwood Lodge, Wren's Nest, Horn Park, Hume Quarry and Swanscombe Skull Site. I'll talk about those in a moment, just in a little more detail briefly. Um, if we look further, 50 or so of the 224 um, have a notified geological interest in them. Uh, they're notified in part as a geological triple SI, um, part of the Geological Conservation Review, which is what GCR stands for. But if we actually think about NNRs in totality, well, there isn't an NNR which doesn't have something geological about it. Uh, sometimes it's really explicit rocks are visible right in your face. Sometimes it's a little bit more hidden, but geology is always there, whether it's shaping the landscape, whether it's part of the processes which shape and form the NNR or the resources which have come from the NNR, could be building stones, could be quarries and so on. So geology is, is everywhere. We've just got to tease it out in the stories we tell. Next slide, please. So on this slide, um, it's we've got the five organised stratigraphically. Uh, that's in order of age with the oldest at the bottom and the youngest at the top. So Charnwood Lodge, uh, that's in Charn uh, Charnwood, which is just outside Leicester. 
Precambrian, uh, some of our oldest rocks. Very familiar to some on the call is the Wren's Nest National Nature Reserve, Silurian rocks uh, in the West Midlands, Dudley. Uh, then we've got a gap, and just remember that gap. And then we go to Hume Quarry, which is Triassic. Uh, desert uh, sandstones and uh, river uh, sandstones, red beds, Hume Quarry, which is just outside Stoke in Staffordshire. Down near the south coast in Dorset, we have Horn Park, which is middle Jurassic limestones, marine limestones filled with uh, ammonites. And then the youngest there is the Swanscombe Skull site, which is about 400,000 years old the site of the famous Swanscombe skull, which came out of a sequence of Thames gravels in the Thames estuary area to the, to the east of, of London. Um, so next slide, please. I'm just going to return to the Wren's Nest National Nature Reserve, um, which, uh, well, for us geologists is the most famous national nature reserve. And for those uh, in the West Midlands, in the Black Country, in Dudley in particular, should be a well-known location. Um, it's our oldest national nature reserve. It was uh, declared in 1956 and it's a series of quarries and mines in Silurian limestones. They're 18th through to the um, uh, early 20th century, the, the quarrying and mining. Um, and today, the remnants of those quarries and those mines uh, form a wooded hill, which is right in the middle of Dudley with Wren's Nest Estate to one side and the Priory Estate to the other. Those limestones expose um, Silurian reefs in situ where they were growing in the Silurian. So the bottom left picture is a view over what we call the reef knolls, which then looks out over the Wren's Nest estate. Uh, there are rippled beds on the site, which is the bottom right picture. You won't be able to see the detail, but mark my words, those are ripples on that bedding plane surface. And then perhaps best known is the beautifully preserved fossil fauna uh, from the site, top right of the fossil crinoids, sea lilies. And then we've got in the middle there, uh, the eponymous Dudley bug, which is a trilobite, uh, Kalimini blumenbachii, uh, beautifully preserved, and it's lent its, it's been given its name because of its prevalence from the, the Wren's Nest NNR in Dudley. And then on the left, if you're lucky when you're out there, you'll spot um, Ian Beach, who's the senior warden for the National Nature Reserve for the Wren's Nest. Next slide, please. So um, let's. Uh, turn towards Saltwell. So we've got the oldest NNR, the Wren's Nest, and then um, less than three miles away, um, we've got Saltwells, which was declared on the 23rd of October this year as England's newest national nature reserve. Um, like Wren's Nest, it's part of our industrial heritage. Um, the NN, well, the local nature reserve and national nature reserve of Saltwells, it wraps around the former open cast mines uh, associated clay pits and the spoil heaps and they're all connected by the canal network out into the black country and beyond. So pictured here um, bottom left we've got the Bruins Canal cutting which is at the northern end of the National Nature Reserve. This is the bit which is managed by the Canal and Rivers Trust in uh, collaboration with Dudley Borough Council um, and uh, that exposes slightly older, I mean slightly younger Silurian rocks than we see at the, the Wren's Nest, but connected to the Wren's Nest. And then we've got a group of younger rocks, Carboniferous coal measures um, exposed within the, the canal cutting. A bit more of that later. If we go south, uh, south of there to the southern end of the National Nature Reserve, uh, top left picture is Dalton's clay pit, which exposes um, Carboniferous River Lane sandstones, siltstones um, and mudstones. And this is the former source of um, the thick coal, which is a 15 metre thick coal seam in the Staffordshire coal field, um, which was open cast mined here. If you look at the tree line across the top of the pit, that gives you a sense of uh, how thick the thick coal was, because that's where it used to be. Um, um, it's also, uh, as the name hints at, Dalton's clay pit, it was the source of the bogs and basins of the Royal Dalton Sanitary Ware, 
Um, so clay from here was used by Royal Dalton for uh, their sanitary wear. So why is it an NNR? Um, what makes it uh, special and get to get that accolade? Next slide, please. Um, I've been talking about Dalton's clay pit and the Bruins canal cutting. Well, they're both nationally important. They're both geological sites of special scientific interest. So it's nationally significant for its geology. Um, going back to the importance of these places for research, well, it has a really long history of research, particularly into the geology. And if we were to look at um, the Dalton's, uh, uh, the, the Bruins canal sections, um, in there, there's a thin bed which is known as the Ludlow bone bed, which is a, a, which produces a very rich um, shelly fauna and the remains of early fish. And it's been the subject of research for many years. Um, illustrated there in the middle um, is quite a recent paper, which is looking at the microfossils from the Bruins Canal section, strange animals called conodont, which is an early ancestral chordate. Um, so research is historical, but still very active. Um, if it wasn't for the conservation and management of what was the LNR and what is now the National Nature Reserve, then we wouldn't be having this conversation because it's that work that has maintained uh, the visibility and accessibility to all those geological sections. Um, so a lot of that is managed around a geological trail, which has um, been recently established as part of the, the geopark, which Graham's going to talk about. So uh, Alan and his team managed the exposures and the viewpoints associated with that geology trail. And here we've got Alan pictured with his high pressure portable hose cleaning down the sections in as part of the, this is a tram line that approaches the Bruins Canal sections. Um, and then showing his care and attention the insert is alan's well I, it's alan's patent salt wells <laughs> shrimp uh, and that is just for those more de de delicate moments when he wants to uh, clear and uh, improve the geological uh, exposures at salt wells so there's a lot of tension goes on from alan and his team across the site also there's a lot of sculptural interpretation um, there are frond way markers uh, there's a time totem pole at the entrance. And then if you go down into Dalton's, what you'll see darting around are these um, giant carboniferous dragonflies, Meganeura, which have been cast from uh, their, their stainless, galvanized stainless steel sculptures, uh, which are kind of bringing the place up to life in a, in a very different way. It's very impressive. Um, next slide, please. So, Lastly, and I'm nearly there now, um, if we go back to this idea and ambition within the um, within the NNR strategy, part of that was to tell this geological story. And um, there is a big geological story that's told at Salt Wells. Um, we've got those Silurian rocks, 420 million years old, with this fascinating fauna and these early fish in it. And then we've got all those rocks which are exposed within Dalton's clay pit and down on the canal section, which are 310 million years old. It's those carboniferous rivers and swamps which produce the coal measures and the coal which was exploited from the site. But we've also got, and Graham, that's Graham in the middle, who's going to be talking in a moment, spanning his lower hand touches the Silurian and his upper hand touches the Carboniferous. He's spanning a missing 110 million years. So the story isn't only what's there, the story is what isn't there. And that was a time of uplift and mountain building and erosion with much less deposition in this area. So we don't have those sediments represented. So we've got environments which are there, but we've got a story about missing environments to be told as well between those seas and swamps. So it's that big story. Last slide, please. So this is my last slide. And I said, look at that gap when I went through the stratigraphical sequence. And there it is filled by salt wells, number six now. It's giving us something about the top of the Silurian in that geological story, and it's giving us a a chapter in the Upper Carboniferous, the coal measures, to help tell that um, story across the NNR series. And um, it, it, it's that very much that uh, 
won it for Salt Wells. It was filling that gap in the story. It had all the things going on and then just that extra story to tell and fill a gap which we which we needed filling. Uh, a chapter and pages in that story which we didn't have that won out very much for Salt Wells as England's uh, newest National Nature Reserve. Um, so that's really what NNRs are uh, and where they fit with where we're going with National Nature Reserves. I don't know if Alan has anything to add to that, but uh, that, that's me concluding. Yes, I mean, that, that shows the scientific place that um, that Salt Wells fills. Um, this is Dalton's Clay Pit, as Jonathan mentioned, um, and we've put in some new access features, which very much help the public engage with the geology in a way that um, is relevant to them. So not necessarily bombarding them with scientific papers, but using sculptures to, to pique their interest and help them want to learn more. Um, that's very much been the approach because we, we're very fortunate to have the experts like Jonathan that can provide sort of the, the postdoctoral level um, information, um, but we want to be able to capture their imagination at the start to bring them through to that level. Um, <clears throat> and also Saltwell's, only part of Saltwell's local nature reserve is the National Nature Reserve um, because only the central section has that geological story. Um, so we still do have remaining areas of local nature reserve, which is still quite large. And they have some geological connections in terms of coal working or, or, or industrial revolution. But the main geological assets are within the central section, which is declared National Nature Reserve. Uh, one thing there you'll see on that map is there's a little cookie cutter bit out next to the N in the NNR. And that's the site we heard earlier from John in terms of the potential development being turned down. Um, very much we're hoping in the future when that land is brought back into public ownership, um, that can become part of the National Nature Reserve in the future. Um, it does have a, a geological story to tell as well with the, um, the Earl of Dudley's residence there. Um, in terms of the benefits of National Nature Reserve to salt wells, being um, selfish of what we're, what we're very happy and excited about is high recognition of the natural features of quality, um, an increased profile of the site to attract visitors and boost the local economy, very much through the geo park, which Graham will be telling you an awful lot more about, um, and also to help us have tighter partnership working. Um, we've always valued the links with Natural England. That's always been very, very key to us. Uh, at, as Dudley, as we are the specialists, we are the site managers, um, but to have that formalised link to the experts is, is invaluable to us. Um, and hopefully for more favourable for external funding bids, you know, you, you never know if if you're in a funding round with somebody and this is a National Nature Reserve where something isn't, hopefully that tips us the edge to, to achieve greater external funding. Um, but for me personally, one of the big things is, is to get the pride of the local population and really boost their... People tend to be very proud of their area, but they're very self-effacing about it. Um, and they won't sing its praises at all. But now we know we're globally important and we've got a national nature reserve on their doorstep. Um, hopefully their chests puff out a little bit more and their heads are held a little bit higher. Um, and they feel personally invested in their green spaces, which we saw obviously through John's story and told you earlier, but this is another part of that, just keeping that momentum rolling, that they've got a real personal connection to their patch. So there we go. Jonathan, anything else you want to round off on that one? Um, uh, no, no, other than I have to apologize because I'm gonna have to leave just after three. Um, uh, I've spent so many years coming over to salt wells and just enjoying my time out there, both the wren's nest and the salt wells. Every time I come out, I learn something new and it's it's all about the people I'm meeting and talking to out there. So uh, great on all of you. Thank you very much. It's really appreciated. And um, so Graham, over to you, my friend. 
OK, well, uh, welcome everybody and uh, thanks again for the invite to come speak to you today. Uh, I'm Graham Wharton. But I was born in Netherton. I grew up and played on this reserve. Uh, so I've got an association with the Salt Bowls, which takes me back to my childhood and throughout my formative years and as a student and as a professional for the best part of the last 50 years. So this is a site that has a personal passion for me, but as you've heard from all of our speakers so far, it matters to a lot of people and it connects us to a much bigger set of stories. The deeper time stories as this wonderful window on the ancient past, but also the current situation and the future aspirations. And one of the really lovely things is that the importance and significance of this site was recognised to the international community and by the international community in July, um, but in a way that celebrates the earth science but supports the local communities. This is the tagline of the UNESCO Global Geopox programme, so it ties up really everything we've been talking about so far. Um, so it's an inspirational place with such deep connections to the story of us all. So if you move on to the next slide, Al, we'll begin about geoparks, because I imagine most people listening to this uh, presentation don't know a great deal about this UNESCO program, what it is. So if Al, uh, I should apologise right away. Alan's going to wear his finger out clicking because I actually put the individual bits of information to scroll up one after another to keep the thing moving. So, Alan, you are my timekeeper. Uh, uh, keep things rolling. So, first, first thing, uh, unlike most UNESCO designations, it's the geopark is about collecting things together. It's not about one specialism. It's not about one little building or site. It's about much bigger things connected together to get the added value of all strands. Um, so this is a holistic celebration. And UNESCO very much see the, the world, uh, the natural world, as um, one entity. Natural history being the history of nature. They see it, and I see it as a geologist, as everything that's gone on in the past to create the world that we live in today. Now, on the uh, 10th of July, 2020, we became a UNESCO Global Geopark. Next, keep clicking out and I'll talk to your clicks. So um, this is part of a global family and we'll look at that in a moment. Next one now, please. And these are fundamentally large territories. So this goes well beyond the boundaries of an individual site or an individual structure. This is collecting a landscape together to tell a landscape story. In there, you have to have exceptional geology and that geology has to be protected. It has to have some degree of protection, preservation and wise use. Next one, please. Al. So it has to benefit people and nature. It's a difficult balancing act, particularly, as you've heard Alan say, where you're in amongst three million people and there's a lot of pressures on the site. And some of that, um, particularly the irreplaceable geology, is difficult to maintain in the longer game. But there has to be an emphasis on sustainability and quality of life and the environment for people. Next one, please, Al. Um, to go with that, you have to have that vision for the longer term. And that's one of the things the community brings to salt wells, the management teams have always had for salt wells, is this idea of a sustainable future. And if you click one more time out, uh, UNESCO recognise all of these things. They've got these 17 sustainable development goals. And in there, you've got all of the ones about environment, learning, quality of environment, innovation, uh, employment um, and climate change. So the geopark and this key site, salt walls, sitting right in the heart of it, has this amazing role to play in the story of the world and the future of the entire Black Country area. Next slide, please. So where are these geoparks? 
Well, if we have a look around the world, and if you click one more time, please, Al, then you'll see they're scattered across the globe. And the globe mm. is in connection through the environment and through the ground on which we live. So you can see there, there are clusters. There are 161 of these geoparks now in uh, 81 different countries. 99% of these are quite remote, remote, remote rural areas. Um, so they, they have quite a different feel to maybe the urban structures that we, we're talking about now. OK, move on now. So let's have a look at the UK. Where are they in the UK? There's a cluster. So um, Europe has a scatter mainly around the more developed areas. Uh, UK has a scatter right the way across. So if we close in again now with the next slide and let's see whether or not you've heard of some of these geoparks. So um, there we go. So if you take a look at the left, you'll see that they range from a group of islands like the Shetlands to northwest Scotland, the Highlands. Then we've got a border one at Marble Arch, which is County Fermanagh between uh, the Republic and Northern Ireland. Then we've got the North Pennines, AONB, is also a, a geopark because of the lead mining heritage there. We're right in the middle now is the newest one. And then you've got Brecon Beacons, the east part of Brecon Beacons called Forest Bower, um, and then the Torbay area. Um, there's a story behind that, but I'll come back to that later. Then if you look at us, we are not only slotting into that national picture, that national, there needs to be a time zone represented in national nature reserves for the coal scenes. We are at a, a coal field. So if you look at that, map of the black country which is probably not like anything you've seen before that patchwork quilt of colors the central stripe which is the gray and purple the green and the bright red is the coal field and right in the heart of that is Saltwell's national nature reserve so if you move on again please Al my slide ah, there we go so if we, we look at this, then we began this project a long time ago. And just like the salt wells and the, the work with local people to protect areas and move it forward and, and to create a future forward dimension, we did this too. And, and we started this initiative as part of a thing called the Black Country Urban Park that came out of the Black Country Study. So it's slow into a concept that could be delivered. Those are the steps. And again, I know this series of slides will be shared. So rather than take time talking about this now, if you if you want to know a bit more about that detail, refer back to this slide from the recording later on. But we'll move on to the more interesting stuff. So move forward again, please. Now. OK, so it's a partnership. And just like all good stories, you have different characters. And that's true of the, the Black Country UNESCO Global Geopark too. The, the, the applicant is actually the Association of Black Country Authorities because we basically look after the bigger territory together. And then um, you have that a lead partner and Dudley is the lead partner for various practical reasons, not least of which because they've got a geologist. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so we can speak for the uh, geological um, connections quite well. Uh, but also um, uh, because we've led on the urban park aspects for geology throughout. Then you've got the other big players. This is not the stakeholders. There's a huge amount of stakeholders below. But the, these are the key players. So you've got the Canal and River Trust. You've got Natural England. Eco Record, the Wildlife Trust, uh, all in there, all coming together to to manage together a much bigger thing and to make sure that individual treasures like the salt wells are well connected within the whole. OK. So it's taking a, a little while for the slides to come up on my uh, screen. So uh, what is the Black Country these days? Well, the Black Country is not 
massive as a landscape, but it is a unique landscape. It's 356 square kilometres. Keep clicking through these. <laughs> uh, it's very strongly urban, which means that the green space is often treasured because it's it's all we've got. Um, 1.1 million people live within the four boroughs. And then within that, we have 200 separately identified communities that relate back to specific industries. You might think of leather making in Walsall or chain making in Cradley Heath. There's lots and lots of individual identity within. And if you ever found yourself falling out of an aircraft over the wren's nest, you would get this view of it. Uh, a lovely green oasis surrounded by 5,000 homes. This is the backyard, the playing space for 5,000 families, but it's also an international treasure. So there is this quite tricky balancing act that we do to make sure that everybody benefits and that the long term sustainability is in place. Carry on, Al. Next one. So one of the really key features that connects a lot of the black country together and certainly connects us to the salt wells is the network canals. There are currently 170 kilometres, which is genuinely twice what you've got in Venice, and it certainly smells better along our canals in the summer than Venice does. Um, so we have this wonderful connection of blue waterways, and we have this incredible story that connects to the rest of the world of industrialisation, invention, ingenuity, that spreads and changes the well-being of the world. So that's one of our key stories within this whole landscape. Next one, please. Uh, it's all right, I'm slowly getting the, the clicks. Oh dear, I've stopped. Here we are. Uh, landscape, uh, click again, Al, please. <laughs> right, uh, so next point about the black country landscape is that it isn't easily viewable. So that from one point to another, you can't see the landscape. So these are hidden gems scattered within it. So threading these together into a coherent story of landscape is another challenge we face here. Um, you've heard it said before, I'll say it again, there is a real passion in the black country folks. We are very self-effacing um, and we forget we are very capable and a creative bunch and that is beginning to come to the fore in these larger landscape projects and the celebration of all the green spaces and the connections between them together. Move on, please, Al. So, where are they? Where are all these spaces that we've told the story of the Black Country landscape with? Well, the red dot in the middle there is salt wells, very well located in the southern part of the Black Country coal field. The stars across the landscape there are 40 more, 40 plus more other features which pick up on parts of the story of the landscape. Wren's Nest, as you heard Jonathan say, is one of the oldest windows on time. It takes us way back to when this area was a tropical sea. Saltwells is absolutely fundamentally unique as the only place in the whole West Midlands region you can see a coal seam that is genuine and there to touch. There is nowhere else in this incredible coal field that you can still see the coal, genuine coal, as it once was mined. That is a phenomenal asset. What are these then? So what, what makes these geo sites within the geopark? So if we click down the next few, please, Al. We can see that they are a mixture of assets that are geological, biological, cultural, like Dudley Castle, we saw a picture of that earlier on. Um, usually they're a combination, but what makes them useful to the concept of helping people is they're accessible. You can get to them. You can see and touch the features on site. They're looked after. And Salt Wells is probably one of the best, if not the best example we've got of that wonderful liaison between local people, local communities and professional management working together to make the best of a site. Facilities on site is a really important one for the salt wells just at the moment because we've finally got the base we've dreamt of for years. 
Um, so if you are going to come to the site, we're going to attract teamwood investment, we're going to attract visitors and health and well-being, physical exercise. You need some focus on site. So we finally got that. And finally for this slide, uh, the final click, which I can't remember what it is now, um, is interpretation. That's that's the one. So uh, interpretation. So of course it's great having these sites, but you can walk on any of our green spaces, any of our parklands, and not really have a lot of information. So if you've got some interpretation on site, it's well balanced and it's put in the right place with the right kind of connection, you can really make the landscape come alive. And this is one of our challenges going forward. So move on to the next slide. Then you create literally um, a journey across a landscape through a site around a park with the resources like this to engage what you are seeing with your own story. You can lead people simply through something that they are familiar with but really didn't know about at all. Move on to the next slide now because this is just an example of how great it can be, the, the stuff at Saltwells. The deeper story is more tricky. What's underneath your feet? Most people walking around a green space never really think about what's down underneath the soles of their feet. But in the salt wells, there is a huge story of a hill being raised by these earth movements of it being broken and of it as it's being raised, poking out these wonderful layers of rock that yield these incredible fossils, these time travellers from previous worlds that existed right where your feet are standing now. So we've got some interpretation ideas underway based on slices through the earth and layers of rocks as columns. So we'll move on from this. This is just an example to show you what we're working on. Um, so that for salt wells, we've got detailed, beautiful interpretation. It's an exemplar of what we can do elsewhere. Across the black country, we have a menu of fascinating things, cultural and natural, that is the envy of most of the other geoparks in the world. It is incredibly rich. When we did the audit of sites that had some designation, were recognised by some formal accolade, there are more than 2,000 in the black country. We selected 45 really key ones, but that will expand. We will build our capacity. And we have this incredible menu that most of our own black country folks are unaware of what's out there. So that's probably one of my key jobs going forward. Uh, move on out to the last couple of slides to finish off. So we want to make the connections. Salt wells, where, how is salt wells connected to the other places? Keep clicking through this, please. Huh? So um, obviously we want to connect it to the biggest, bigger world out there. And we want to connect it to the other geosites. So how do we do that? Well, what have we got? Well, walking and cycling routes is one. And if you look along the the the, the footpaths of salt wells, they go somewhere. They don't just go around salt wells. They connect out there. The canal network will connect, connect you to 170 kilometres. Then we've got the old railways, the abandoned railways, such as the Pensnet Railway, which runs and connects right the way to a new beautiful um visitor centre. We've also got coming in right now the new metro line and that will connect just along the canal to the footpaths which will get people to some of these geosites. And finally of course we've got the canals themselves. We've also got the atmosphere, the, the airways. So we have these beautiful blue and final click for this slide please on. It is just a, how attractive and carbon friendly, the movement between some of these sites can be. Onwards, please, Al, to the last but one slide. So there's plenty of ways of making the connection. If we have a look slightly more detail at the metro angle. So again, click through the slide if you would, Al. So there's the salt wells again. Now we're going to show you where the current metro line is with the next click please on. So that links 
Birmingham to Wolverhampton, but we are just creating the cross city lines. So if you click the next one, it shows you where this one goes. So when this does show, hopefully. Have you clicked it, Al? Oh, I have. Oh, it's not come up. <laughs> not on mine. Ah, it's, it's there. Right, OK. So you can see now that we are trying to move away from road transport. Car parking is always an absolute pain. So if we can encourage visitors coming in from, say, the Birmingham end from the airport to come through along these routes, then not only will they get a sense of orientation of the space they're moving into, but they'll also be connected to all of these black dots on the plan, these geosites. Each one of those metro stations on the cross city line that we're working on at the moment, well, the 17 stations, we're trying to get connections through and to green spaces, local heritage features and these geosites. So there's a whole geopark way being created to link together the green spaces across the whole territory of the Black Country UNESCO Gold Geopark. Final click on this slide and then on to the last slide, please, Al. I'm sorry, my internet's terrible. So that is Parkhead Viaduct where the Metro line will cross over the canal and give a view of the landscape. Move on to the final slide, please. Sorry, I'm taking too long, I do apologize. Um, so what do we want the geopark to be for us all, for all these green spaces, for all these features? Where are we going with all of this? Well, we need to connect it together uh, that's the first thing. Click right the way through this slide, please. Now, um, it's going to support and grow education project products, innovation with conservation techniques, it's going to strengthen community and business links, um, particularly local hospitality. Um, we've got some innovation going on with three dimensional scanning of spaces, both indoor and outdoor. So some of these features can, can be captured and some of the some of the new um, links that we're making and the COVID pandemic has created opportunities as well as considerable difficulties. Um, businesses can engage in different ways and one of the one of the sensitive ways in which we can highlight some of the features is to light light up structures um, in non biological areas such as the Red Esco. So final click on this slide and we'll we'll get to the end. Sorry, there's a delay on my internet connection. I do apologize. Um, it's coming. Uh, go on now, keep clicking. I'm very sorry, it's just so slow. Everybody's on the internet buying Christmas presents this afternoon, I think. Um, uh, and click beyond that one now, please. I'm sorry, my, my uh, system is just not showing me the final slide. In a nutshell, they, we hope the geoparks really going to help people to see the landscape as a bigger entity, to see how the green space is joined together. Um, we know it's going to raise the profile of everything you guys do for the green spaces, the education teams give opportunities to friends groups to be more engaged with doing good work to to upskilling people for boosting the economy and one of the figures for the black country prior to covid i thought i'd stick in is that one there which is that in 2014 the visitor economy people coming to the um, black country to either look at an attraction, visit a show or, or stay, stay over for a wedding or whatever was worth about 900 million pounds a year. By 2017, the same analysis shown that had grown by a considerable 50 million pounds to 950 million pounds a year. And that is without anybody knowing what we've got here. It's, we, before we got a UNESCO designation and, and our profile was raised. On the 10th of July, when we became a UNESCO Global Geopark, we had nine and a half million international hits looking at the Black Country designation. 
so it takes us into a whole new league of inward interest. Um, the one of the most important aspects of that is always going to be how we manage that for the community benefit. Finish off clicking this one and get to the very last slide, which is the oh, thank you, Al. Oh. <laughs> and um, and so we're at the start of a journey. We're working with fantastic world class assets such as the Salt Bowls National Treasure, the National Nature Reserve. And that will lead us forward into a future where the environmental issues are raised so that people are more aware of their impacts. We get the chance to be more connected to our landscape than ever before and provide more opportunities for everyone. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight into the geopark. I'm sorry I've talked so much and I'm sorry my internet was so slow, uh, but hopefully that's shown you how this national treasure has come from community asset to international dual. So I'll shut up there. Thanks ever so much, everybody. Alan, I've muted you. Alan, if you want to say something, you'll have to unmute yourself. I just want to say thank you very much to everyone that's, that's helped with their presentations, and I hope um, they've given you a bit of a taste of what's going on at the moment in Dudley and across the Black Country. So I will be quiet because I'm aware we've, we've overrun. So thank you very much for everyone and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you everyone for your um, very, very inspirational uh, presentation. Have we got any questions? Do you want to raise your hand if you've got a question or put it in the chat alternatively? There's um, only 21 of us, so we can do it by raising hands. Lawrence is raising his hand, I believe. And Hello. Yeah, Lawrence, do you want to say something? Yeah, I um, I was very lucky enough to uh, go and see salt wells that early this year as part of the green flag judging, and um, I was amazed amazed at what I saw there, and um, and a testament to what all the work they're doing. It was fantastic, and uh, I think more people should be aware of what's out there and um, enjoy what got on your doorstep, really. So uh, yeah, it was a, a congratulations to you all, and uh, especially getting the NNR. So it's uh, onwards and upwards. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lawrence. James, do you want to say something? Yeah, I just wondered when you were first going through the process of declaring the NNR, did you actually get much wariness and objection from people? Because I know even creating LNRs, sometimes people have wariness about what restrictions it might bring. No, um, received very, very little um, concern at all. I think people were um, were really hopeful for it. I don't think I received one issue at all. Sometimes about the car parking, the amount of car parking and whether it's big enough to accommodate all the new visitors. Um, but other than that, I cannot recall a single negative or cautious comment. No. Right, Please hear it. <laughs> I just wanted to say that um, you know John is a real inspiration, John John Williams, um, for how he managed to cope with you know the the very quick turnaround of, of the development and and the the um, the planning application. Um, and I was in in Dudley at the time, you know, really really um, hopeful that uh, you know the outcome was going to be good, which it was. Um, now I'm in Walsall, we've got um, a similar issue and um, I think my colleagues will probably want to call on you, John, to uh, ask you to come over and uh, inspire <laughs> people I've in actually Walsall. Already, I've actually yeah. already missed <laughs> You've John made that while we've been talking. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, just to say, genuinely, I was, I was often the face and the voice of stuff that I knew very little about 
or I, I, while I was able to give some time to that, there were there was such an incredible team of people that that really kind of got behind the whole project. Even with the friends group now, they kind of won't let me go. I did offer to step down because I'm often very busy and not able to join in the practical things they're doing. But for some reason, they still like me telling them what to do and keeping them in order in a meeting. Uh, but um, th there are some absolutely incredible people, both part of the friends group and just other people that that use that uh, the reserve for uh, you know their kind of daily exercise that kind of thing um and and they're really the stars i i, I was given you know i was given a, a starring role if you like but the script was written by somebody else so great richard do you want to say something yeah just either alan or john if um i could get in touch with either of you i've got a handful of proactive members that I just think would need some guidance to sort of be shown the way hopefully and so if that's something we can get together about that'd be really helpful yeah it's great so anybody feel free to get in touch yeah thank you very much so um we're going to break for about 10 minutes is that right Alison and uh come back in um that's right yeah at uh, 15.35, if you wouldn't mind. Um, and then we'll carry on with the presentation from the Fields in Trust.
Hi Liz. Hello. Um, Chris Warman's just dropped a note that um, he needs to be away by four. So, um, should we put him on early or? Yeah, if if that's convenient with Rodri, yeah. um, when he's back in the room, we can check with him. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, hi Rodri. Thank hi. you. Are you sure that's okay? Yeah, no problem. Ready to go. Thank you very much. Yeah, Liz, Liz, and uh, I'm back in the room. It's Jonathan here. Hi, yeah. Uh, Welcome I've made back. Made it. Yeah, thank you. In that time, I've made it home, and I'm awaiting my parcel. So, if there was any question, I, I'm not expect. Uh, you know, if there was there any questions, I'm very happy to answer them around MNRs. Um, but there might not have been. James just asked a question while you were out about um, if uh, local residents had any issues to do with um, the designation, because he obviously has experienced um, problems with designating local nature reserves, which is interesting. It was more whether, yeah, people who don't perhaps fully understand the what nature the ramifications are for people are, yeah. and nature these days and whether there was any wariness about it restricting people's use of the site um i think you'd have to ask you'd have to ask alan in relation to salt wells um, yeah they said not which was positive I no thought. so yeah no so i'm not aware of anything um yeah no i'm, I'm not uh, i'm just thinking about the wren's nest i mean the issues on the wren's nest are all those urban issues irrespective of whether you've got a national nature reserve or not um it's you know it's the it's the classic um uh, built up area with housing estates very close into the nnr the key to it um the key to it is that relationship with the local community 
because if you get that right, then they're then they're an asset to what you're doing. I think you all know this. And if you get it wrong, then at best they're neutral, but often they're not an asset to what you're doing. So it's you know. So what's been such a success at Salt Wells? And at the Wren's Nest in, in recent years has, have been the, friend, the friends groups, which have really, really helped in different ways uh, with the, the looking after those NNRs. Mm, good. I think it's a good question, though, James. Um, we've had a few inquiries about the geopark and the geosites as well. Now, the change to a UNESCO badge, does that impose any strict, any more strict requirements? And the answer is no, not for the geopark. It, it is about those relationships and about um, with development in particular, early consultation so that everyone talks about what the concerns and issues are. Um, so, yeah, the thought was I'm aware of nothing at all that came back. Good. Good. OK, so um, we've all had our 10 minute break uh, with changing the agenda slightly in that Chris Warman needs to get away by four so Chris is going to do his presentation now about um, our response to um, the government's COVID-19 restrictions and, and the various tiers that we've now been put in so Chris can I hand over to you yes apologies for no camera I've had power outage this morning so um it's sort of knocked all sorts of problems so uh but i am here which is a shame because i've got a fairy lights up in the in the in the study um i've got, I've got a christmas jumper on um <laughs> but never mind you're missing all that but uh but apologies about that it, it's really just to update you on the tier system because we had lots of questions last week coming to us uh, as we moved out of lockdown into the tiers uh, as most of us are either in two, tier two or three, uh, and to be fair, I think most of us actually are in tier three. Um, it is quite confusing, some of the guidance information. And I have emailed Alison this morning a link to Sport England um, that, that have produced quite a handy guide actually to help us through it. Uh, but, but the headlines for you is the facilities that were all closed can reopen. So that tennis course, basketball, skate parks, BMXs can reopen and gyms can reopen, or green gyms, as long as they're all COVID secure. The bit that becomes far more complicated is when it talks about spectators to any of those. Uh, because in tier two, the rule of six applies to spectators, including grassroots sport. Um, but in tier three, spectators are not allowed unless it's juniors or under 18s and then their parents are allowed but only in their household support support bubbles um, so, so it, it starts to get very confusing and very detailed so apologies about that uh, but the sporting link guidance does help you through that um, because i know a lot of us are getting lots of calls um, and I was on with the Birmingham FA yesterday that they're, they're equally as confused. Um, they produce some of their own guidance, which actually is more confusing than the government guidance. So they're reviewing their guidance. But if, if you stick to Sport England, um, it, it is slightly clearer. So all, all organised sports back on. So football's back on. Even rugby can be allowed. Um, so, so that's uh, not too bad at all. Uh, and running events can restart. Uh, so you can have running events again, albeit I believe park run is not going to start until the new year, was what I was told yesterday. Um, again, they all have to be with their COVID secure risk assessments um, to make sure they're following the relevant, relevant guidance. Um, the difference possibly this time, especially around the sport and spectators, because it is confusing, uh, the, the, the leagues and the national bodies will be taking action against those clubs that don't conform. So if they're not controlling spectators, they could be dropped from leagues or lose match points and things like that. Um, so, so the governing bodies are taking a far more stricter approach um, to try to keep sport going um, because the, I think the government's made it quite clear, if not, then, then things will stop, stop dropping back off again. Um, 
and there's already possibly talk of a lockdown version three, which, which sounds like an awful movie, um, which is nothing like the original. Um, <laughs> it's the only way I can describe it. Um, so we don't want to go down that road at all. Um, so, so that's basically it as we are. Um, most things are back on, but the, the, it does cha change from tier to tier. If you're in tier three now, on the 19th of December, going to tier two, some of those detailed regulations do change. Um, so, so, so just keeping on that guidance. Um, I believe in terms of volunteers, Sam's just asked a question. Um, I think tier, all tiers are the same. Volunteering is allowed, albeit with COVID secure risk assessments and socially distanced. Um, so, so basically, as we were doing it pre-lockdown two, which was the second movie in the series, obviously. Um, so, so yeah, so, so volunteering can continue. Um, the other bit, which makes it even more complicated, as it all moves around, it's like a moving feast. If you're in tier two playing sport, you can't play a team from tier three, and if you, and vice versa. So a, a team in tier three cannot go and play a team in tier two. Uh, so somewhere like rugby, for example, which is on the boundary with Northamptonshire, a lot of our clubs are cross-border clubs. So, but basically most matches are off because they play each other. And our, uh, rugby is in tier three, Northampton's in tier two. Um, so it, it, it's a moving feast. Um, but if I refer you back to the Sport England guidance that Alison sent out on that link, it, it does help you through it. Um, and I'll stick to that guidance because the governing bodies are are getting very confused so um hopefully that gives you a little bit of assistance as we continue to battle on through the guidance um around this uh, any comments please drop us an email i've gone on the call with the government next tuesday so i can feed back again to cabinet office um, if any of this is, is causing any more issues than we've already got to be fair uh, but we are trying to ease out some of these uh, issues to us all Hope that's useful and apologies A for technology and B to for moving fields in trust about. So uh, thanks to, uh, to fields in trust. Thanks, Chris. Have we got any questions from anyone? <clears throat> Again, show show hands. Can't see any. James. Chris, on the football club thing, I hadn't really thought about that, about clubs coming cross boundary to play each other. Um, It'd be interesting to know if if the FA are kind of getting that message out clearly to clubs and, and presumably the onus is on the club because the one team who books the pitch off us, for example, might be our local tier three team, but we won't know if they're playing a tier two team. The, the FA issued some instructions yesterday and then quickly took them back in again because they weren't <laughs> correct. Um, <laughs> because they were stuck in with the interpretations as well. Um, but they have issued more guidance this morning, I believe, basically saying you can't play a team from a different tier. So, so the club should be aware of that. OK, all right. Hello, Luke. Thank you. Thanks. Chris, we're getting quite a lot of pressure from um, our uh, fun fairs, our, our showmen who haven't been able to um, make any money in the last um, nine or ten months. Um, so they're thinking about you know, next year and February in particular. Um, what is the position in tier three with fun fairs? Do you know? I believe tier three, they're not allowed. OK, uh, I, believe I had a bit of a read through the guidance and I, I, I sort of thought oh, it, it's kind of, you know, you can't have indoor things in permanent. You can't open indoor things on permanent theme parks and fun fairs but it kind of by implication it was you can still open the theme parks and fun fairs so it was a little bit confusing yeah, i think i think visitor attractions are closed in tier three yeah uh, so it, it depends what the class does um yeah. legal definitions do vary um i want everything past our legal team now just on the safe side right because um, it is right. it, it is a little bit complicated <laughs> um but yeah if you if you're unsure check your own legal, legal teams uh, we I believe were all these because they were traveling fun fairs and we thought previously that you know 
<coughs> they weren't static ones and we might consider opening static ones but we wouldn't open traveling ones um yeah and i think probably it's the same thing. yeah we're suggesting that nothing nothing before easter i don't think is, yeah. is realistic what yeah. we're saying to them yeah right if there's any other questions just drop just drop an email to me lovely thank you thank you thanks chris right we will um return back to rodri and Fields in trust. Hi. Hi, Rodri. Hi. Is, is the uh, presentation there ready? The, the PowerPoint. It is. Yes, Liz. Can you? Um, do you want me to share my screen, or can you control that? I haven't got the presentation. I'm afraid. No. I, I've got that. So, shall I share my screen from this end? Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, so I've got it up on my screen and it's working. Um, and I'm trying to share content. Do you need to unblock anything, Liz, your end, to allow me to share? Don't think so. If necessary, Alison, just share your whole desktop and make sure that that's the the window that you're on. OK. Can you see that now? No. Nope. Any luck? No. Nope. Shall I make a start? I suppose that well, the one thing I wanted to show was the video at the end. So if you're able to get that ready, um, I can try and talk through everything else. I've never had a problem sharing before. It's really odd. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off, see if that helps. And then I'm going to try and share again. <coughs> no, sorry, it's it just it's just not coming up. Just don't understand why. OK, sorry about that all. <laughs> Can Any you share there? from your end, Rodri, or not? Um, no, I'm sort of my Teams is operating outside the platform where my where the PowerPoint is. I'm afraid. Um, I can try and I'll try and talk through it. Oh, oh, this looks promising. Yes, um, yeah, Alison, you've got it. Okay, I don't know what I did, but that's great. <laughs> You could just go to slot. Yeah, brilliant. Great, I'll make a start. Um, well, th thank you very much for the opportunity to join your webinar today. Um, I'm standing in for Angela Lewis, uh, trustee of the Parks Forum um, and Fields and Trust head of programmes and development manager for the Midlands. So I expect uh, many of you will know Angela very well. Uh, hopefully I won't let her down today. Uh, I'm the, the Fields and Trust Development Manager for Wales, but work closely with uh, Angela and other colleagues throughout the UK. And on a personal level, um, a close friend of mine is from Dudley, so I'll have to tell him all about the, uh, the National Nature Reserve at uh, Saltwells. Uh, I've been a member of your equivalent body in Wales, Green Space Wales, for about uh, 10 years now. And it's um, it's been quite a sad story, really, sort of during the Sort of early and middle parts of the past 10 years as, as local authorities were dealing with budget cuts and you know, many faces were disappearing from around the table people with lot, lots of experience and expertise uh, and i remember some meetings with you know small numbers in attendance so it was, it was quite depressing but um encouragingly that the, the group has, has had a resurgence in recent years uh, with meetings well attended and more authorities uh, and relevant organisations joining, so it's so it's a lot more positive now. And uh, I know it's following closely the progress of the 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 new Parks Management Forum, which uh, I expect you are too. Anyway, I'm here to talk about uh, fields and trusts and specifically our protection work, and I'd like to go through th a few slides. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, and uh, yeah, if you could press play, great. Yeah, this um, 
this is a sort of animation, it's a, a, a timeline of the sites we've protected since our founding as the National Playing Field Association in, in 1925. Early on, it was mainly the King George's fields uh, established in memory of our founder, King George V, and then sites protected by way of covenant as, as a condition of grant aid, and also many sites were gifted to, to Fields and Trust or National Playing Fields as well as the Association as it was then by, by landowners to, to ensure their preservation. We, we protect, uh, it'll come, when it comes to the end of the animation, you'll see we, we protect uh, 2,000 870 sites in total throughout the UK. Uh, and what is interesting is that 1,732 of those sites, nearly two thirds, have been protected in the last 10 years. Mostly QE2 fields celebrating the Queen's Diamond Jubilee in 2012, mm -hmm. and more recently uh, centenary fields marking 100 years since the uh, First World War, which so those 1,732 in the last 10 years, which against the backdrop of austerity is incredible really, uh, with parks departments suffering, uh, as I indicated, with sort of people who lost in Green Space Wales. But I, I think it shows there's a, a clear appreciation of the importance of parks and green spaces uh, and the need to protect them. I think if you look at the final graphic there and all the, all the dots, uh, you can see in the Midlands at least that wherever you are, you're not too far away from a, a site protected by, by Fields and Trust. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, the, the need for protection is more relevant than ever with budgetary pressures and the need for housing, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, once a piece of land becomes threatened with development, it, it can disappear very quickly. And it's encouraging to see how the nature reserve in uh, Salt Wells was, was able to avert that th the threat there. Uh, he, here circled it, um, the light green circle is the Wilfred Owen Memorial Playing Fields in Ingleborough Road, the Wirral, um, Merseyside named in on memory of the celebrated war one poet. If you could go to the next slide, please. And however, despite subject being subject to a to a covenant, they were sold for housing development. In just one year, the space that had been used for generations for organized team sports has gone from a playing field to a, a built up area. I'm sure everyone will know of a, a park playing field of Greece space that, that has been lost. Uh, I remember growing up myself playing football on a lovely pitch, a lovely surface, but that now is our, a roundabout. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Yeah, in, in comparison, here is a field that's protected in 1938 through, uh, as the King George's field. And this probably en encapsulates best what Fields and Trust is about. On the left, you can see the field pictured in 1946. Um, very little sort of housing, small little village. On the right, you can see the same field pictured 70 years later. You could see the level of development that's taken place around it, um, how that village has, has grown massively. Uh, and without protection, you, you wonder if that, uh, if that field would still be there. Uh, importantly, you can see no new green spaces that have been built into the surrounding developments, and making the site that we protected even more important, serving the whole community. And this this also illustrates sort of how the protection of land can act as a, as a fa fantastic uh, memorial, a lasting memorial. King George V died in 1936, yet the playing fields that bear his name are still going strong. There's, uh, just over 500 in the in the UK altogether. Through the next slide, please. So um, the protection of green spaces. Uh, there are a number of ways of protecting parks and green spaces. Uh, no one alone is sufficient to, to safeguard them, but uh, together they can they can provide an effective uh, framework of protection. Uh, first and foremost is the need for quality provision well designed to high standards, located where it will be of most value to the community, landscaped appropriately, maintained the highest possible condition. If this applies, then the site's the best chance of being used and valued and therefore unlikely to be targeted for development or disposal. I'm sure 
all you really you will know of a site or a park which is so important to the community you you can't ever imagine it being being targeted for development in the main however we, we rely on the planning system the town and country planning law uh, it has much to offer but it doesn't support the statutory protection of green parks and green spaces and planning policy is is open to it, interpretation there's uh, the local green space, uh, green space designation in England, unfortunately for me, it's not in, in not in Wales. But uh, the weakness in it, in it is it is short term. It only applies for the length of the plan uh, of the local plan and reviewed every five years. There are also covenants, which, as I mentioned, we have used uh, Fields and Trust has used in the past, but they have their weaknesses. The Wilfred Owen Memorial Fields, which I showed earlier, was a uh, which was subject to a covenant uh, being an example. To go to the next uh, slide, please. So um, protection of fields and trust, how, how do we protect land with, uh, with landowners? Um, uh, we have a unique deed of dedication which provides robust yet flexible uh, protection in perpetuity. It uses contract law to establish a legally binding commitment between fields and trust and the landowner. It is independent of the planning process, so even if planning permission ha has been obtained, fields and trust consent is needed for any changes. The, the deed enables positive recreational development, which includes ancillary for, uh, structures and buildings, such as pavilions, um, changing rooms, storage facilities. Landowners are free to change the recreational mix, such as installing outdoor gyms, play equipment, moogers, tennis courts. Uh, we don't seek to micromanage. It's how you want to set out to design the land. We don't, there's no specifications of what facilities you provide and sort of maintenance schedules. As long as it's open and safe to the, to the, to the public, then that, that's, that's fine with us. We just ask that you keep us updated. Um, so for our records, each site has a dedicated web page on our on our website and um, detailing the facilities, uh, description things. So we like to keep that up to up to date. In, in protecting with fields and trusts, land remains uh, in the ownership of, of the existing landowner. There's there's no sort of transfer of ownership, and management also remains uh, remains the same. In, in terms of the, the types of land that we protect, it is pretty much uh, all types of space accessible to the public. Um, fields and Trust, and before that, National Playing Field Association have um, traditionally been associated with land for sport and play with our guidance, planning guidance, focusing on those facilities. But we will protect any space um, important and accessible to the community, including, for example, uh, nature reserves. and. Perhaps once the ownership issues have been sorted for the salt wells, perhaps we can work together to, to protect that as well. For the next slide, please. So in terms of the, uh, the protection process, um, the landowner completes an initial application. We get a lot of applications from various bodies and groups um, wanting to protect a particular site but it has to be the landowner as they will be entering into the legal agreement we will carry out some initial background checks um, in case there's any sort of existing restrictions or covenants that aren't compatible with, with our protection then we will uh, carry out a vis site visit it's uh, just just to make sure it's uh, suitable for protection um, with those are proving a little difficult at the at the moment with the pandemic so we are sort of asking uh, landowners if they can provide videos recorded videos and photos of the site so, so that we can have a look at them then we will uh, draft a deed the, the deed of dedication uh, that is sort of checked and agreed with with the landowner before it's uh, signed and executed land registry titles for the site are, are updated so sort of so they include the details of of the deed of ded dedication, and then we'll provide a commemorative plaque, so it so indicates the public that it is protected with fields and trust. And finally, we would also encourage um, 
local celebration of protection. The landowner is carrying out an, an act of goodwill in safeguarding an important facility for the public. So it's, it's only right that, um, uh, that we, we celebrate that. And next slide, please. So um, why protect with fields and trust? Well, um, don't take it from me. We have this quote from a local authority officer uh, in Northern Ireland. He said that Sandy Bay playing fields is such a part of the community that everyone feels as though they have ownership of the green space and you could, can't put a monetary value on that. So protecting these spaces for the future means that people will be able to spend time there enjoying green spaces for generations to come. Also on the next slide, if you go on please, we have this short Oh, um, short video. Um, it's about a site we protected. If you're able to play that, I'll, I'll let them speak for themselves. If uh, you might not be able to, I, I can't hear that, but uh, I, I, there are subtitles, so. No, that's fine. You're clearly more technologically advanced than me. <laughs> I'm going to just restart it because I've, I've increased the volume. So just go back. Can you hear that? Alison, I think it's to do with when you just first of all choose to share, there's a button that you click to say share sound as well. So we can either just watch it with the subtitles or you'd have to start sharing all over again. Oh, OK. Thanks. Yeah, that was just uh, one example there of the many sites we we protected um, around the UK, and you can see there sort of how important that space was to to the the town of Hailsham, and um, they were only too pleased to to protect it to ensure it remains for for future generations. Uh, I think that that sort of concludes um, sort of presentation not on the protection work that the chair did mention the start. I was going to talk about a toolkit. Uh, I wasn't aware of that, but um, I'm sorry about that. But uh, uh, perhaps it, it perhaps it was about the Watch This Space, which is a, a resource for communities to champion and support their local green spaces, uh, helping them with campaigns to to fight against threats. Um, to parks and green spaces, got lots of useful information of the planning system, planning policy, and sort of an example of uh, letter of objection. Um, so, if that was the toolkit, um, I can send a link to that, which um, which I'm, I'm sure you would find helpful. Um, but other than that, that that's um, that's it for me. Thank you for your attention. But um, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Rodri. That was uh, really interesting. Have we got any questions from anyone?
Hello? Is that you, Lawrence? It is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, just interested, I've never really thought about it, but um, obviously there's, there must be a cost to set up the, the protection of, of, of that piece of land. And um, obviously that cost would probably change with the size and the scale and the, the what's involved really. But is, uh, is there any guidance on costs for protecting that, going to that with Fields in Trust? We don't um, apply any, there's no fees for um, applying and protecting. Um, the the only sort of costs you would incur is is if you use a solicitor to help you through the sort of process of completing the deed of dedication. Um, there's also some small nominal fees or sort of entering the details on on the land registry uh, titles, um, and also we, we would ask that you erect uh, install a plaque. Yeah. So any costs or either. So yeah, the, the main would be if, if you using a solicitor right but but uh, we we have our own solicitor that would be happy to sort of guide you through the process it's fairly straightforward a lot a lot of authorities uh, are able to manage with that one Magic. thank you very much um Stuart Stuart do you want to say something uh yes uh I just got a, I think you, you kind of answered it but um we, we have a situation where we've quite a few um football groups and that wanting their own little uh, place kind of thing we've got a few parts where you know they're they're, they're actively seeking kind of a license to maintain a, a pitch and and possibly the building or the park pavilion as well um presumably the fields in trust designation would preclude that and um because uh, i think you've said on one of the slides that the ownership management and maintenance needs to be retained by the landowner is i just wanted to double check that was the, the case really um yeah we, we've we've seen a, a lot of that over recent years sort of local authorities looking to sort of um you know offload the sort of um liability of managing and maintaining facilities and there's been a, a lot of leasing of of sports facilities um it it, it depends really um if if they, they have been uh, approved but it, it depends on the individual circumstances but if it was like a uh, one pitch within a, a larger site where the public ha still had access to the majority of it and that the particular club that was taking on the lease had an open membership policy so it was effectively a sort of a community club then yeah. those cases uh, have been approved but if it was a, sing a site which was mainly consisted of uh, pitches and one particular group were trying to um take on lease for the whole site yeah, then yeah, it's your that's, one, really yeah um, yeah yeah but it's it's good because there obviously you get political pressure and things with as well with some groups you know and, and wanting their own sort of facility so it you know it's just good to know that the, in some way you know, the uh, the designation kind of helps to protect um and make sure that the the facility is there for everyone really which is what uh, I guess it was aimed at when when they were set up, really, you know. So that's that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Is there anything else from anybody else? Nope. Thank you, Rodri. Okay. Um, James, can you go on to the next? That's it. Yeah. So um, that's it really for today. Um, Alison's asking you to do an evaluation um, for the webinar following that link that she's provided. Um, because we're still funded through the lottery, it's really useful to have those evaluations. So really appreciate it if you would do an evaluation. It's really helpful and do it now before you forget. <laughs> Next slide. Alison, do you want to come in here? Yes, I'm just um, I'm just pasting the link into um, the chat there as well, so that Lovely. will uh, make it easier for people. Because um, I know what it's like once you've left the meeting; it's uh, it's another thing to do. Um, so I'm just co copying that now, and I'll paste that for you. 
Um, yes, so the other information we wanted to share is our next webinar in January. Um, at the moment, we've got um, a definite sort of booking from the Landscape Institute who will be talking about the skills and competency um, uh, development and how that would work. Um, and also there are two opportunities for all our members to take part in training, which we are subsidising again through our lottery grant. Um, thank you to those people who've already booked places. Um, so that's introduction to parks management, which will take place at the end of January and then advanced park management, um, which is in February. Some people have booked on both, so they're very keen to take the whole journey there. So that's really, um, really good. But um, please let me know if you want more information. Um, I can send you the links through to the ABSI um, webpage, which gives lots more information. The introduction um, training they mentioned recently had had 100% positive feedback. So I think the courses have been remodelled, redesigned, updated with COVID in mind, updated to um, be more appealing online. Um, so hopefully that will appeal to lots of people there. So um, just drop me an email if that's something you want more information on. Lovely. Next slide. OK, and just again from me, thank you to everyone, um, the whole team at Saltwells who've put everything together. Um, Rodri for standing in for Angela, who's um, who's been furloughed for this month. So it's really helpful. And I think just having that connection um, and having the resource because the recording will be available on our website. Um, we'll get that up there next week. It's just a resource for um, for our members to go to if they're experiencing problems. And I think we've all been in that situation, you know, even even in a small scale with small losses of land. Um, so I think um, to be forewarned and forearmed is really helpful. I'd just say from um, when I was in Warsaw, I did um, three pieces of work with Angela to um, secure three pieces of land that were in urban areas and there's, there's um, I think the toolkit, I think Angela mentioned that's in, in sort of development at the moment. When that comes, that would be really helpful because I think from local authority side, there's a whole process, you know, that's that's lengthy and detailed. And in Warsaw, we had to have, and as I'm sure others do, have cabinet approval. Um, so that was um, quite a journey from our side as well. Angela was really supportive. The legal team at Fields in Trust I found really supportive as well because um, you can sort of set aside a year really for, for, for some start to finish. So it was a job well done in the end. Um, really pleased we had the opportunity to do that. So um, thanks again. And that's it from me. Lovely. Thank you very much. And um, Merry Christmas and stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to the speakers today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.